All right, this is the fourth in the series of the respiratory system. Um, it's the last one. It's going to be a hodgepodge of some of the most important things I want you to know with the respiratory system before we go on to the next organ system. We're going to talk about the chest and chest wall of abnormalities, what to do with the chest traumas, lung tissues, um, atelectasis and surfactant, a lot of case uh, examples in here. And then we're going to talk about breath holding and how much time you have um, to go without oxygen. Okay, so this is a loop. This is a video loop of a patient. So it's, um, look at his chest. Look at the tracheal tug. So there is the thyroid cartilage, a tracheal tug every time this pulls down. So things are moving, chest is moving. Um, so is you're actually, you're looking at him to make sure that he's got active ventilation. So his chest is moving, abdomen is going up and down, but is gas exchange taking place? answer is no. So you can tell with inspiration and this tracheal tug comes down, the chest caves in instead of rises. This is what's called paradoxical breathing. Tracheal tug is a sign of airway obstruction. And anytime you start recruiting these um, strap muscles, the sternocleidomastoids, that's also a sign of respiratory distress. So this is uh, most likely due to over sedation, patients waking up still heavily sedated and the tongue is obstructing the airway. Okay, the next presentation. Um, so this patient, as you saw, has what's called pectus excavatum. Pectus means bird, so bird chest. We've got kind of that like an excavator, caved in chest. Um, it ends up pressing down on the heart. And so the heart has less filling. And so it decreases uh, blood volume for the heart, less exercise tolerance and potential drop in blood pressure. It's not that uncommon. Um, Maybe you know someone who has it. You can lie on your back and eat M&Ms while you're watching television. So Jeff Goldblum, Paul Abdul, Tori Spelling, all have pectus excavatum. Now theirs is most likely not severe enough that they need to um, have surgery, but surgery is, for, um, is an option for those patients that have severe exercise intolerance. Airway obstruction, let's talk about that. Causes and management. So the different types of airway obstruction, we've talked about it before, like with Denny's and the pancake business. Um, but with the first patient we saw in this presentation, the tongue was obstructing. And that's usually the first, the most common cause of airway obstruction. And the treatment is just getting the chin lifted, the jaw thrust, and then getting it into a recovery position. That also helps with um, that obstruction. Trauma, um, you can get a piece of some dentures, tea, something that's gotten down in there. And the treatment for that, of course, is bronchoscopy. If you can get down there soon enough um, to get to a bronchoscopy, if they can breathe around the obstruction, if it's not 100% obstructed. The other is uh, a child that's aspirated uh, coin, toys, popcorn. The treatment of that, if they're um, able to breathe around the obstruction, is bronchoscopy. And I'll warn you that um, if someone is breathing around an obstruction, it is much better not to put your finger down in the throat because you're more likely to press it down further and cause a complete obstruction. 
So if you see a child, they're breathing, and maybe it's real noisy breathing, the most important thing is to get them in for medical care if someone's actually able to breathe around the obstruction. So this is a child um, case scenario. They're removing a coin using a ridge bronchoscopy. And this is obviously under general anesthesia. Now, there's a couple different forms of bronchoscopy. The rigid is used when they're trying to remove something like a coin because they can put graspers down, grab the coin and pull it straight out. The fiber optic is used for like looking for tumors and they can take small biopsies of the tumors. All right, so you're looking down into the trachea. This is under bronchoscopy and the place where it splits is called the carina. It's right here, that little shiny spot, that's at the end of the trachea, the distal end of the trachea. That's extremely sensitive. If you touch it, people cough, even if they're under deep, deep, deep general anesthesia because it's really a reflex. So stimulating, it's protecting the lungs, that final pathway of anything going down into the lungs. Um, okay, so you're looking down at the lungs and in which bronchus, bronchus is this coin wedged? In the right side or the left side? And so the right side. So notice the rings, they're always going to be anterior. So here's another doing fiber optic bronchoscopy. Now the bronchoscopist will typically stand to the side looking down into the lungs. Now, if you're going into anesthesia and you're placing double lumen endotracheal tubes and you need to look down into the lungs with a fiber optic scope, um, you will need to know this. I've learned this the hard way, not knowing that anterior is, is this appearance where the rings, those C-shaped rings are anteriorly. So that tells you that going the right side this is the right side, and this is going to be the left side. And this gets you situation, this is a fluoroscope, you can see there's something going on in this side, possibly a tumor. So look at this view from a bronchoscope. Um, lung cancer shown by the black arrows. Which side of the bronchus is this in? Is it in the left or the right? So your view is kind of twisted. So you're gonna to have to untwist it in your mind and look at those trachea rings. And the answer is in the left side. And if you were actually doing this procedure, all of this is being distorted by the lung cancer. So to help or orient you, you might wanna go down the other bronchus, get yourself oriented and then you'll see that the right from the left side. All right, so the next thing, we're going to go into some case presentations. This is in a low resource setting. This was a little boy who came in with a blunt chest trauma. He um, had a pneumothorax, which is a dropped lung. And so he had to have a chest tube placed. And we did that in the operating room under IV sedation. And I just want to talk about um, the placement of chest tubes, which you've probably heard before. So this is where anatomy matters. Um, the small, small anatomy. So in between each rib are these intercostal uh, bands of muscle, but underneath each rib inferiorly at each rib is this kind of a notch. And within that notch lies the vein, arteries, and nerves. So when you're placing um, like a pneumothorax, even if it's under emergency, make sure that you go between the ribs and you like you actually try to hit the rib at the top part, the cephalad part, and go to the very top of the rib. 
So if you go underneath the rib, you're likely to hit a nerve, artery, or vein, and then you develop a hemothorax. So important to know in emergency situations like your um, rescue squad, paramedic, patients having a flail chest or like you suspect a pneumothorax, you're putting an emergency um, chest tube, make sure that you place it on top of the rib. All right, so these are some key, uh, this is a case scenario. Uh, we're not gonna go through completely, but these, these are some good questions to ask. We have a woman, motorcycle mama. So she's a chronic lung disease. She's been a heavy smoker. She gets in a uh, motorcycle accident. She's got lots of rib fractures. She's tachypneic, which means she's breathing fast. 35 times per minute, that's, uh, could either be that she's pain, having problems ventilating, um, or scared. All of those things could be cause of the tachypnea. So you're trying to tease that, those causes out. But her oxygen saturation is only 85%, and she's on supplemental oxygen. So that's a poor sign that the lungs aren't getting oxygenation. So your concerns are going to be a pneumothorax, which is highly likely. And then how are you going to treat this patient? With a lot of rib fractures, patients have problems um, taking deep breaths. It hurts. So it's important to treat the pain, but if you give them a lot of narcotics, you'll uh, decrease their respirations. So in these patients, one of the best ways of treatment is a um, epidural. So they get pain control, but they don't get um, the respiratory suppression. So very um, uh, epidural with very low dose medication so they can take a deep breath without hurting. And that will prevent them from having to go on a ventilator. Lung tissue, surfactant, and atelectasis. So the last few topics. So the surfactant is what keeps the alveolar, alveoli open. So this is another case presentation. This is a 15-year-old girl, came in with this abdominal mass. So she's very thin and she looks like she's pregnant right here. So she's having a surgical excision of this mass in the operating room. And this is what the mass is. Um, it's an ovarian tumor. It's a probable dysgerminoma, which is malignant. In this setting, uh, we were unable to get tissue biopsies, there's no way to find out exactly for sure. Um, sadly, there's no treatment either in this setting. Um, it's a slow growing tumor. So even though it was the ovary was completely removed, it was highly you know, likely that there were metastases. So one day after surgery, um, as a young 15 year old girl, she is refusing to get up. It hurts to take a deep breath. She starts to develop this low grade fever. It could either be that she's developing an infection from surgery or that is atelectasis of the lungs. This is the most common cause of, of fever, the first, a low grade fever one day post-op. Atelectasis is um, when it's collapse of these alveoli. And this is the uh, respiratory therapist that was helping us. And standing behind is her father giving encouragement to take deep breaths. So let's talk about atelectasis. There's an area of collapsed lung. It's either from um, immobility or it could be from thick mucus. But this could be a cycle. So with immobility, thick mucus collects, and then that traps um, the bronchus, and they start developing fever um, from secretions. And naturally, there's going to be bacteria there that aren't being swept away by the cilia, and that um, infection just kind of smolders. 
So the, the real thing is to prevent atelectasis. And so in patients that are um, reluctant or bedridden, reluctant to take deep breaths because of pain, um, in this, uh, in, you know, in developed countries, spirometers are usually given to patients after surgeries and they have to blow them up. And um, this is a course of a disposable glove. So that's an adapted um, spirometer to help get the patient to open up their airways, take a deep breath and forcibly get all the air out. Okay, next question, which part of the lung is used for respiration? And remember respiration, the definition is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So for the exchange of oxygen, carbon dioxide, is it happening in the trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, and alveoli, or in the alveoli only? Answer, alveoli only. So the trachea, bronchi, and bronchioles are considered conducting, like a train conductor. It's carrying the oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. The oxygenation of the blood happens only at the alveolar level. So think about a newborn trying to take their first breath. What keeps the alveoli from collapsing back again after they take their deep breath? Is it that they're getting positive airway pressure or alveolar surfactant? Answer is alveolar surfactant. This is, let's do a case presentation that helps to explain this and what happens with the development of surfactant. This is in a low, this is a low resource setting as delivery of twins, um, their 28 weeks gestation. And this is me trying to ventilate and you can see how teeny tiny this little baby is. So the baby cried well for the first minute and then started having respiratory distress. So really working hard to breathe. So that's when I began, began the assisted um, ventilations with the bag and mask. So would it take more or less pressure to ventilate this preterm infant versus a full term infant? And you'd think tiny little lungs would take less pressure, but the answer is it takes a lot more pressure. There's, they were so stiff. Lungs were incredibly stiff. And that's because this child hadn't developed um, surfactant in the lungs to keep the alveoli open. These, um, this surfactant is secreted by the type two alveolar cells and that keeps the um, small alveoli open and they reduce surface tension. So if there's no surfactant, the alveoli collapse and it takes a lot more pressure you have to keep expanding the alveoli with every breath. So in developed countries, um, patients, the little ones, if they, um, if you catch it before delivery, you can give the mother um, steroids, Decadron, and that will help with surfactant production in the infant. And for the little ones that are born um, maybe four, 34 weeks, they can have um, surfactant given, you know, sprayed down into the trachea. And this is showing the lungs collapsing before the surfactant and after the lungs are open. And if you can see this right here is the endotracheal tube. This right here is the endotracheal tube going down uh, between the vocal cords. And you can actually see the split, the trachea, the split of the left and right. It's the right side, the left side, um, bronchi.
All right, so let's go on to another topic. This is scenario challenge. You're preparing for a general anesthetic. Um, the anesthesia medication's injected, and then the patient stops breathing. Apnea is no breathing. How much time do you have to place the breathing tube, the endotracheal tube or the laryngeal mask airway? How much time do you have to get that in now that the patient's apneic? Do you have 60 seconds, three minutes, or does it depend? And the answer is it depends. Takes us to our next topic discussion, time before hypoxia. Hypoxia means low oxygen. So the time with breath holding depends on a couple, two factors. Metabolism. So metabolism is your inner fire, how fast your body cells are taking up oxygen. And the other situation is how much oxygen is already there when the patient became apneic. So let's look at this question. Breath holding challenge. Who can hold the breath longer, a non-pregnant or a pregnant woman? The answer is, actually, this is wrong. I'm sorry. This is a non-pregnant woman can hold the breath longer. This is, got to fix all the mistakes, but a non-pregnant, a pregnant woman has a higher metabolism. Let's get out of there so you can't see that anymore. All right, so let's look at the time to hypoxia. I made this graph and this right here, the blue line is someone who's just breathing quietly. Normally you're just sitting there and then all of a sudden, you can't breathe anymore. So you haven't taken a deep breath, nothing. You just completely stop breathing. So your oxygen content is roughly 100 millimeters of mercury in terms of content. This is not percent, this is content. So in about two minutes, you're completely without oxygen. The green line is someone who's gotten oxygen or hyperventilated for a couple minutes before holding the breath. So if someone gets pre-oxygenated for three minutes before induction of anesthesia, they have a much greater margin of safety. So they can hold their breath for several minutes. So that's how divers do it. So they hyperventilate or they breathe oxygen before doing a deep dive. So they can breathe uh, you know, out of an oxygen tank. That's how deep divers are able to dive deep for long periods of time, relatively speaking. So below this, hypoxia is below, you know, is low oxygen, so like below 40. And then anoxia is when there's no oxygen in the blood. So that brings you to the best ways you can save a life is making sure that the person is getting oxygen. So the most effective ways give oxygen, assist the breathing. And if you're doing an anesthetic is before um, you give all the medications is to let the patient breathe oxygen with the mask for a couple, three minutes before that way, if you know you have difficulty placing the airway in the tracheal tube or LMA, you don't have to feel like you have to rush. You can take your time. You can do it slowly and carefully, not knock out any teeth in the process. So for situations where the breath is being held, always pre-oxygenate with 100% oxygen. Don't rush. And if you um, can't intubate, make sure you can ventilate with a bag and a mask. 
So I'm going to show you um, a couple videos. This is me in the operating room bag and masking a patient. Patients, if you notice down here, the syringes. Patients gotten the medications. Let's run the video. So I've got her airway up. I'm holding her chin. With the other fingers, I'm holding her jaw thrust and her chin rest. And we'll put in an oral airway. And then keeping the tongue down and then flipping it over. Chest rising and cut. Okay. So now I ventilated the patient for three minutes. And now I'm going to place the endotracheal tube. So I have a great blade, taking the oral airway out, and pushing the forehead back. Now there you see the epiglottis channel. There you go. Perfect. Okay, then I'm going to go down and I'm going to clean out the epiglottis. See? Okay, there's the cord. There you go. So the vocal cords are a little bit moving. Okay, now I'm going to the tube. Go through the cords. Okay. Okay. okay, so plenty of time to be pre oxygenated. So, in summary, we've talked about chest wall, the lung tissue, and breath holding. Let me ask you just a couple questions before we finish. Why are rapid small breaths not very helpful, helpful for effective oxygenation? A, air is quickly moving in and out of conducting airways, or B, less air is getting to the alveoli. And the answer is both. Air is quickly moving in and out of conducting airways, and less air gets to the alveoli. So when someone is worried about not getting enough oxygen, tell them to slow down, take nice deep breaths. Remember that air exchange only happens at the alveolar level. So all of this blue conducting airways and rapid breathing, hyperventilation, um, fast breathing, you're not giving time for gas exchange. And remember, time to hypoxia depends on the metabolism, how fast your inner fire, how, how much oxygen you're needing, and also depends on how much oxygen is in your blood in the first place. So metabolism can be elevated with infection, pregnancy, hyperthyroidism, it can be slowed down with aging, hypothyroidism. And your oxygen, greater oxygen, if you pre-oxygenate someone, you get someone to take big, deep breaths. And lower oxygen is at high altitudes or in cases of anemia or lung disease. So the point is just keep breathing. That's it. Thank you for listening, tolerating my dog in the background, and I'll see you with the next organ system.